Okay, so let's start. So, uh, again, for those, I just mention it again. For those that uh, are interested to figure out what they've done wrong on the exams or the quizzes, the TAs are available, yeah? They have office hours. So, we cannot distribute all the exams and quizzes so that we, you can study it at home. But please visit the TA, please talk to them, and they will show you the answer, the question, and they will go over it, okay? Over things you've done wrong. Okay, so this chapter covers interpolation methods. And those methods are useful if we have some x, y data, and we're trying to predict the value of y at the value of x for which we don't have a measured x value. So there's all kind of different interpolation methods. And this chapter covers two different classes of interpolation methods. And we will go over those today. The first type of interpolator is an interpolator that fits the entire data time series or all the data that you have. And there's three different forms of those. That's one with an, uh, a polynomial with monomial basis, a polynomial with a Lagrange basis, and a, pol a polynomial with a Newton basis. So let's go to line 134 to 136. This is the definition of a polynomial with a monomial basis. So essentially, we've seen this before in the function polyfall, for instance, where we have coefficient 1 times x to the power n minus 1 plus coefficient 2 times x to the power n minus 2 plus all the way to the end coefficient n minus 1 times x plus the last coefficient. So what you see if you have n coefficients, the highest order is n minus 1. Okay, and that's important. So if we have n data points, we need n coefficients. So we have a polynomial with the highest order of n minus 1. You see that over here, yeah? Again, I mentioned this on Monday. This is going to be a question on the quiz, and it's mentioned at several places throughout my script, throughout the script. So this is an example of a polynomial, and that's why it says here, polynomial p of order n minus 1. So a polynomial of order n minus 1 has n coefficients. n minus 1 refers to the highest order of x. So you see that we have n coefficients and the highest order is n minus 1. So you need a polynomial of order n minus 1 to fit n data points. And this is definition of a polynomial with a monomial basis. So the basis functions are x to the power n minus 1, x to the power n minus 2, and all the way up to x and then 1. Those are the basis functions. And those are valid basis functions because we typically know the x values. The coefficients do not appear in those basis functions. So that's why they're called valid basis functions, okay? Now, another polynomial interpolator is one with a Lagrange basis. And that, this is the definition of a polynomial with a Lagrange basis. So this is again for interpolation. And here you see the order. So this is again the p from polynomial. This is the order. And then x. So we plug in an x value. And this predicts what the corresponding y value is. So again, why do we do all this interpolation? Because in many cases we do not have a physics-based model or a conceptual model that predicts y from x. So we need some other type of methodology. And that's where these interpolators can become very handy. But inter interpolation methods are typically only useful in the domain for which you have data. Once you start predicting outside that domain, the results are not often not very reliable because the behavior of the system might change. Think about the stock market. We have an entire time series of data. Let's say we look at the data from the last 
6000 days. We fit a uh, polynomial with order 5999 through that data. So we get a very nice data fit and then we predict what it's going to be tomorrow. It's unlikely that you create a perfect prediction. Okay, because the system might change tomorrow. Something might happen like terroristic attack and that's not in our polynomial equation. So this is the definition of one with the Lagrange basis where we have our first observed y value times basis L1 plus our second observed y value times basis L2 all the way up to our last observed y value times the last basis. So these are all, you will see, they're valid basis functions. And now I have to go back to line 237. Here you see how these basis functions are defined. So in this case we have a polynomial with a Lagrange basis with three different basis functions. So we have y1 times L1 plus y2 times L2 plus y3 times L3. And the definition of L1, L2 and L3 is written there. <coughs> and what you see is that L1 is x minus x2. So in the first part you don't see x1 appearing there. You see x1 appearing in the denominator. Okay, so you see x1, x2 and x3 in the uh, denominator and that refers to L1, L2 and L3. So you see them up here, yeah? So essentially what you have for L1, you have x minus x2 times x minus x3. So you use two other data points and x1 is not in there. Now if you look at L2, you see that you have x minus x1 and x minus x3. So x2 is not in there. The third one, L3, you have x minus x1 times x minus x2. So x3 is not in there. The x3 value happens then in the denominator like x2 and x1 com uh, compared to L1 and L2. So you can set up these functions relatively easily. So these two polynomial interpolators are relatively easy to implement and I, to I try to write this out here, okay, With an, uh, where I use variable a and b. So please look at that. Now, what we have not covered is the polynomial with the Newton basis. And these are a little bit more difficult. Now, this is simply the definition you see on line 284. So polynomial that's of order n is an unknown coefficient c1 plus c2 times x minus x1. So x is the value at which we like to predict y. Yeah, that's x. And x1 is our first measured x value or, or another measured x value. We'll talk about that later. So we have c1 plus c2 times x minus x1 plus c3 times x minus x1 times x minus x2, etc. And that goes all the way up to cn plus 1 times x minus x1 all the, times x minus x2 all the way up to, and there's an error in the book there, so all the way up to xn minus 1 times x minus xn and the book has an xn plus 1 there so there's a little error in that book. Okay so, so actually if you go type in the name of the author of the book you get the website and there's links on there that mention that you can PDF files that show if, there's er er if there are any errors. So if, you, if you're studying the book or you're studying my script or whatever and my script refers back to the book and you're like, hey, I don't understand this part. Then you can always go to his website because people, when people write books there's errors in there. Even in the seventh edition there will be errors in there. Unfortunately, it's just 800 pages and people make mistakes. Happens all the time. Now, so the basis, the Newton beta polynomial, the basis of those of a Newton uh, uh, polynomial is x minus x1, or yeah, you have 1 for c1, then you have x minus x1 for c2, you have x minus x1 times x minus x2 for c3, etc. All the way up to the last basis. Now, the book continues with two particular polynomials with a Newton basis. Those are the quadratic ones and the cubic ones. And those are very closely related. And what I have here on line 299 is the one with the quadratic basis. And that this is the definition. This is a second order polynomial. Yeah? 
So we know that the second order polynomial has three coefficients. So you see P2 is C1, unknown coefficient C1, time typically what we've done previously was that we had C1 times this thing plus C2 times this thing and then plus C3, but the book put it up front. So the C1 would appear at the end, so automatically it would be C3 in this case, but in this case we start with C1, then we have C2 times x minus x1 plus C3 times x minus x1 times x minus x2. That is the quadratic basis. Now, and then there are some constraints because you want to make sure, the, the question is how do we derive C1, C2 and C3 now, yeah? And what do we know? That if x is equal to x1, if we fill out that x is equal to x1, then automatically our polynomial should go through our first data point, yeah? x1 corresponding data point is y1. So if we fill out here x1, then we get x1 minus x1, so this is essentially c2 times 0 is 0, plus c3 times x minus x1 times this, this also becomes 0, so what we have? p2 x is c1, and per definition we want our polynomial to go through our data, which means that the first coefficient is equal to our first data point. Now, the same holds for these other constraints, and you can work this out, okay? And then you can actually substitute this here on top, and you'll see that everything works out. Now, obviously, if you want to derive the coefficients, you can also write this in matrix notation, uh, uh, so where we see that we have 1, 0, 0, so for uh, the first uh, constraint at C1, that's a 1, and then we have 0, 0, and then for the second we have a 1 for C1, for C2 we have x2 minus x1, for the third one we have a 1 for C2, uh, C1, for C2 we have still the same, and then for the third one, C3, we have x3 minus x1 times x3 minus x2. So, if I would have written this book, I would not have included all this stuff, because I think it goes a little overboard. So, you can generally expect that we're not going to ask you to do a Newton basis polynomial interpolator, okay? If we do, we'll give you a lot of information how to do that. So I don't expect you to know all this in detail. Again, if I would have written this book, I would have just have highlighted a few polynomial interpolators in such a way that you feel that you have the ability to figure out other interpolators if desired. And again, MATLAB has built in interpolation functions, and we'll talk about those on Friday, perhaps even today. And those are the ones that you really are supposed to know how to work with them. Because those are the ones that you will use in exam 3, and perhaps quiz 3. Okay? MATLAB has all kind of built-in interpolators. Those are the most important, because I cannot ask you um, to say like, you know, here we have x, y data, and now tell me what the Newton base, the quadratic Newton basis polynomial gives me at this x value, because that requires you to write all this code. It's just too much. Now, you can write this stuff here, all this, and this, is also called divided differences. So we can write it this way and we can write it this way and so there's a function that the author created which is called divided difference table that based on some x values and y values gives you the values of d which essentially correspond to these different bases here, okay? So now, so this was a quadratic one, so we have a quadratic one over here, this is a quadratic one, and now we can also have a cubic one. Now that's similar to the quadratic one, it just has one additional term, a C4, where we have x minus x1 times x minus x2 times x minus x3. So it just has one additional term, and now here still the first coefficient equal to uh, y1, the second coefficient is now the divided difference of x1 and x3, the third coefficient is the divided difference of x1, x2, x3, and the fourth coefficient is the divided difference of x1, x2, x3, and x4. So it's a little too much to go over all this in detail, but 
So you've seen this here, where it's shown where how you compute the divided difference of x1 all the way up to x4 is equal to the divided difference of x2 up to x4 minus x1 to x3 divided by x4 minus x1. Now these, these three you can compute as follows is equal to the divided difference of x3 and x4 minus the divided difference of x2 and x3 divided by x4 minus x2. This is just work. This just requires calculation. Okay? And that's why we have this function script here that gives us these divided differences for any values of x and y, what we desire. Now, an example, the book then comes up with an example with the cubic uh, uh, interpolator, I believe, where there's data of the temperature in degrees Celsius versus the viscosity of uh, glycerin. So we have T is temperature and mu is the viscosity. Okay? And now the question is, we have this data. If we now use a Newton basis polynomial, uh, and in this case it's actually a quadratic one, the question is what is now the viscosity at the temperature of 22 degrees Celsius? Okay, so we can solve this with, an, uh, inter uh, with an, uh, a monomial interpolator, yeah, we know now how to do that, we should be able to do that. We also know how to do this with a Lagrange interpolator, but let's now do this with a quadratic polynomial with a Newton basis. Now it's a little bit more complicated so we have to go back to our original function. This is our original function, okay, that tells us that the predicted, uh, the predicted viscosity as function of temperature is the function value at T1 and we'll talk about what, what T1 is in a second plus the divided differences of T1 and T2 times the 22 degrees, the temperature that we like to know, minus T1, plus the divided difference of uh, T1, T2 and T3, times the temperature 22 minus T1, times temperature 22 minus T2. That's our definition. So now we have to fill this in. How do we fill this out? So, um, so we know the first thing we need to do, if we look at 22 degrees Celsius, then we're in this interval, we are between temperature is 20 and temperature is 30. So the idea is now that T1, T2 and T3 should be the closest three observations we have. Because if we interpolate bet uh, between 20 and 30, it likely doesn't make a lot of sense to use T1 as 40 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Celsius. You want to use those support points that are closely around that value at which you like to interpolate. So if you look at this data set, then at, at 22 de degrees Celsius, the closest three points are temperature is 10, because 22 minus 10 is 12, 20, that's only 2 degrees Celsius away, and 30, that's 8 degrees Celsius away. So what T1, T2 and T3 become temperature at 10, temperature at 20 and temperature at 30. So when we do this interpolation with the quadratic pol polynomial, which is a uh, uh, second order, we only use three data points. We don't use all the data points. You could use all the data points if you want, but then you have to start uh, resolving the divided differences of temperature 1 all the way up to temperature 6. Yeah, so we have f of t1, t2, t3, t4, t5, t6. We can solve that, no problem, that, 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 that function in MATLAB, the, the, the divided difference table can do that for you, it's just a lot of work. So what makes sense is to just use the closest few observations. So not use the entire time series, you can do that and you will see that you get a different answer, but just use those three temperature measurements that are closest to where we like to interpolate. We like to interpolate at 22, so that's close to 20. So these three data points with these corresponding viscosity values are the closest to 22. So that's how we define temperature one then becomes 10 degrees Celsius, that's this value. Yeah, so this value is 10. Now temperature 2 is 20, temperature 3 is 30. So now F temperature 1 here 
Yeah, so T1 is 10, so FT1 is 3.810, so that's what we have here. So that's the predictor or the measured viscosity at 10 degrees Celsius. Then we need to resolve this, the divided difference of T1 and T2. We need to know this one. Now, that's equal to the second observation of the viscosity minus the first one divided by the second temperature, which is 20, minus the first one, is 10. So that's what you see here. This is the viscosity at 20 degrees Celsius, this is the viscosity at 10 degrees Celsius, and this is 20 minus 10, and this gives us the number. Okay? So now we know on line 364 we know the first one, that's 3.810, and then we know that the second, and then 3.810 minus this times 22 minus T1 is 10. So that, so that we know. And then we have the last part that says divided differences F of T1, T2 and T3 times T minus T1 times T minus T2. So we know that T1 is 10, T2 is 20, so we have 22 minus 10 times 22 minus 20. So this part here is done, but we need to still resolve this part. Now, divided difference of those three values is equal to the divided difference of temperature 2 and temperature 3 minus the divided difference of temperature 1 and temperature 2, divided by Temperature at the right hand side minus the temperature at the left hand side. So T3 is 30, this is 10, so this is 20. Now we know how to resolve these ones by now, okay? Now if you fill all those uh, things out, then ultimately what you're going to get is that this divided differences thing is 0 0.0073. Now if you now fill out that entire equation, what you're going to get is you're going to get these values all filled out and you're going to get the predicted viscosity of 1.204. So if we go back here, then the predicted viscosity with our polynomial, with the Newton uh, basic quadratic one, at t, t is 22 degrees Celsius, the predicted value is equal to 1.204. This is the viscosity, the predicted viscosity at temperature 22 degrees Celsius. Okay, and this is how you can resolve. If we like to interpolate at 32, if we like to interpolate at 32, then our basis would be 20, 30, and 40. So we redo the entire exercise we did here, but then with the values of 20, 30, and 40. Again, you can do this, in this case we only use three support points. Because then we have a second order polynomial and with the divided difference, the highest order is Ft1, T2 and T3. But if we, we can use all six data points, then you have again a divided difference of T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, T6. Now that's a lot of work. Okay, and the author has written scripts how to do that. You're, it's too much work to reproduce that during an exam, so this is just to illustrate how that works. And this is the script that he wrote, that this divided difference table here. Okay, this automatically computes the D are the divided differences. So that's, and so I, we can execute this. So let's first, remember we had this problem with the year and the price, where we had cash prices, so let's just apply to this one, year and price, and then we do the divided differences here. And we use all the data, so now we have the divided differences here, they're all calculated, where this is F1, F2, F3, F4, F5, F6. So this one is F price 1, comma price 2, comma price 3, comma price 4, comma price 5, comma price 6. So we need to derive from this, we're only interested in the diagonal elements, those are our F values. <coughs> and this essentially is the biggest part of the inter interpolation, yes? This takes, this is the calculation time. So if we then want to interpolate the price in 1991, because that we did with the Lacrans in the monomial basis, we interpolated what the cash price would be in 1991, we can do the same with the Newton, with the quadratic polynomial, 
And what, what we use here is we say, you know what, we're not going to use all six data points. You can, you just specify one through six and price one through six. But in this case, we only use three, like the same as with the viscosity, okay? So then we execute this script. And now what you see is these are the divided differences. F1, this is F price one, F price one, two, price one, two, and three, okay? Now, now we can fill out our equation because we know our quadratic uh, polynomial with the Newton basis. That was our first observation, our first observed value. Plus our second, uh, F2, that's the, uh, those F values, yeah, those divided differences, times the difference plus the third divided difference times, this was the, uh, the, uh, the interpolation minus T1 times the interpolated value minus T2, okay? So this is essentially, so we can predict the price in 1991, and that's 140.5625. So we need to go back if that makes sense. So we plot the data. Let's see here. Um, let's see here. We'll quickly do this. So this was the data, yeah? With a, a, a monomial interpolator, yeah? And now we predict in 1991. We don't have a data point. And what we predicted that it was going to be with the Newton base is going to be 140.5625. Now, is that reasonable? Let's see here, we just go here and we've seen... So we predict here that it's a little higher. So the monomial interpolator says it's 141.1 and what we came up with is 140.5625. So what you see is those different bases give different results. The different interpolators give different results. So if you want to forecast the stock market and you use an interpolator within sample and then you predict for the next day, then you might want to be, instead of using one interpolator, you might want to use ten different ones and then average their outcome or so because they all can give different results. So we go to original view. So let's go down again here. Oh. Now, obviously, I picked here, if I want to predict in 1991, yeah? I had the price here, uh, and I had the year. I wanted to predict in 1991 here. So my closest data points are 88, 90, and 92. The same holds for, you could also have picked 1990, 92, and 94. Because 1991 minus 1988 is 3, okay? So obviously these two are always closest, but instead of this one, I could also have picked this one. We picked this one, 1988, to calculate the divided differences. We could have also picked 1994. Now that's essentially the first, what we did here is where you slightly get a different estimate. You see, you get 140.9375 because you pick slightly different data points. So that's, uh, that's clear, yeah, here. If you look at the year, and I try to predict in 1991, that I can use the y-value, the closest ones are 1990 and 1992. So we use their y-values because we know the, the value of the stock or the cash price in those years, so we use these two. But I can pick this one as a third support point, but I could also have picked this one because this is three years away and this is three years away. Now you see that you get a slightly different result. So now obviously you can also use more data points. In this case we use four data points. Okay, if we use the divided difference of year through to five because now what I used, I used this one, this one, this one and this one to interpolate in 1991. Okay, now, now we have our F values and now we can fill out our equation and we get 140.750. So we get slight differences based on the data points we use and the number of data points we use. Now, we can also use all data points. We, I wrote a quick script for that that immediately tells us what is the value if we use all data points. 
and that's this value is 141.0863 because remember we had six data points of year versus cash price or oil price and then the third input argument was the year I really wanted to know what the value is and that was 91 so again these are called support points you can use all of them in this case or you can just use the three closest ones or the four closest ones now this is uh, um, yeah okay now there's one problem with these polynomial functions okay that this is a big problem and that is that if the number of data points is large they start to exhibit wiggle and what is wiggle? That's oscillation behavior, which means that you can imagine if you have three data points, then what you need is a second order polynomial. Those are relatively stable, but if you have a hundred data points, then you need a 1990, uh, 99 order polynomial. Now then you have something that is x to the power 99 plus x to the power 98. Now you can imagine that those are quite unstable if you go a little bit outside the domain. And I have an illustration for you here. Then we need to go to lecture 20. Here what I show for instance. Imagine that we have simply the sine of x. We have some data here. Okay, let's remove all this here. I want to interpolate this data, okay? So I just created a hundred values of x versus the sine of x, and I plotted those. And now I have a hundred values of x versus y, and now what I need is a 99th order polynomial to fit this data, yeah? Now we can do that, it's no big deal. We just use this polyfit function, so this is with the monomial basis. So now I have 99 coefficients, now I can actually evaluate that and I can plot it and then add the legend. Now this is what you see what happens. You see, we have a hundred data points, we use a single polynomial to fit all the data and that, that, those are the ones we discussed so far, so that's one with a monomial basis, a Lagrange basis, a Newton basis. We use all the data in some sense. You, you've seen that with Newton you can also use certain sub-intervals but the idea is typically that you use all the data. <laughs> Now what happens here is look at the behavior here at the end because now we have a polynomial that says that's x to the power 99 plus x to the power 98 so coefficient 1 times x to the power 99 plus coefficient 2 times x to the power 98 all the way to the coefficient n which is 100. Now what you see here at the end is that suddenly a polynomial becomes completely unreliable. So you might be able to fit a large portion of the data but it's completely unreliable because you have something that's raised to an order 98 and believe it or not about three months ago I got a uh, in next year I, I believe there is some uh, uh, exercise or whatever by course and there's an example or so where interpolation methods are needed I had a student emailing me and said Jasper we went over interpolation methods in class and I used those but I get completely unrealistic results and that is because he was using like 50 data points and he was fitting a single polynomial through all those data points and then you can show you can see behavior like this okay and that's because this is not desired so that's why in lecture 20 there's a solution to this problem okay but the author also discusses so instead of fitting a single polynomial through all the data you do something that's called piecewise polynomial interpolation where you fit the polynomial function through parts of the data. So what we did at the end with the temperature versus the viscosity is an example where we had six measurements of temperature and six measurements of viscosity I believe but we only used three to predict what the viscosity was at the temperature of 22. We didn't use the ones at the left and the right hand side, temperature of 0 and um, temperature of 40 and 50 I believe. And that's what's called piecewise polynomial interpolation where for each part, depending on where you like to interpolate, you select the few closest 
observations and you fit a polynomial function through that data. So you don't end up with the problem that you have a polynomial of the order 99, order 999. Because you only need a few data points. Now, there is different types of, you have a piecewise polynomial interpolators, that, that's a standard uh, interpolation method, that's also in MATLAB. Then you have a piecewise linear interpolator. Now that's easy, yeah? if, you have, if you want to have da two data points, so if you want to predict, uh, let's say, in 1991, the cash price, then we take 1990 and 1992 and we just linearly interpolate. That's a piecewise linear interpolator. We also have a piecewise cubic Hermite interpolation method and a cubic spline interpolator. Those are more complicated. They look much nicer though. They give better results, but they're way more complicated. And they're actually built in in MATLAB, okay? So we'll quickly go over the theory. Uh, we have 14 minutes left, but um, they're built in MATLAB. So they're built in functions that you can use. That's most important that you know how to use those. So again, why is this piecewise linear interpolation or piecewise interpolation important? It avoids having to use a very high order polynomial to fit all the data. Because honestly, if I try to predict the stock market tomorrow, I don't need data from 1850 or 1900 or 1950. Yeah, maybe it's useful if there was a terroristic attack in 1950, then I knew how the stock market reacted, so I could use that. But in principle, most information about the weather of tomorrow is the weather of today and not the weather of last year. And that's the thing with interpolators that we've talked about so far is sometimes it doesn't make sense to use all the data. You only use the closest data because those typically contains the most information. If you have to predict the weather for tomorrow, Without anything, you're likely going to say, I predict that the weather of tomorrow is similar to the weather of today. That's your best guess, particularly in California. Yeah? And you're not going to say, you know what, to predict the weather of tomorrow, let's go back a year. Or let's go back uh, three months. You're just going to use the closest data, which is today. And that's what's piecewise interpolation. And there's, again... Instead of monomial basis, a Newton basis, a Lagrange basis, there's again a different set of methods. Spline, cubic hermite, and linear interpolation, and then poly polynomial interpolation. So again, I try to write all this out again. Here I explain again what interpolation is and what extrapolation is. So again, interpolation is if I try to predict the value of y, between x is 0 and x is 2, that's interpolation. And extrapolation is when you try to predict the value of y for values smaller than x of, uh, of, of x is 0 and for values larger than x is 2. Because I don't have data in this interval. I don't have data for values smaller than x is 0. So it's, it's a leap of faith. And that's what we often do. Scientifically, in the whole climate change debate, yeah, when you hear, like, again, what I already said on Monday, when, when, what happens when the concentration of CO2 doubles on Earth? Then you have all these models that create predictions, but the assumption is that the behavior of the Earth system we see today will be similar if the concentration double, and we don't know if that's true. Some people... You know, like also if you look at humans, they don't react linearly to systems. You know, some people might not be able to handle very little stress so that you think, oh wow, what happens to this person if this person is under a lot of stress? But it turns out that a person can suddenly handle a lot of stress very well, but little stress not so well. So it's all possible. It's the same with Earth's There's feedbacks that we don't know. That's why extrapolation is always dangerous. And that's why we build all kind of complicated models that built in a lot of physics that we hope that we do it correctly. And that's why you see that no one says the temperature is going to increase 2.1 degrees Celsius. 
they're always going to say the temperatures can increase between one degree Celsius all the way up to possibly six. They give a range because these models are uncertain. There's errors in there, like we don't know what the aerosols are going to do, for instance. Now, piecewise polynomial interpolation, so we talked about that. So I can, and here this, I try to illustrate why we need to do piecewise, uh, piecewise interpolation with the example of the sine function, yeah? That's a very simple uh, example that demonstrates don't use all the data, just use data on a small interval around which you're trying to interpolate. So, now yeah. So here's an example, for instance, of linear interpolation, okay? So imagine that this is our data, x versus y, yeah? <coughs> and we try to predict the value of x, or the value of y at x is 0 0.75, yeah? Now, what do I do if I linearly interpolate? I just take the value at x is 0 0.6, which is 1.0173, uh, 1 and I take the value of, uh, of, uh, of y at x is 1, and I just linearly interpolate. So I know that 0.75 is closer to 0.6 than it is to 1.0. So now I can take that in my calculations, and that's what we did over here. And if you do that, what you will see is that you predict that y is 1.0257. And believe it or not, this interpolator that you see here, this linear interpolator, is, looks very similar here, is identical to an interpolation with a Lagrange basis, but then using only two data points. These were the Lagrange. This is the formulation. So these are, this is my x, x values at which I like to know my y value. This is my second data value, this is my first, etc. Okay? And I, fi I define my x values to be x2 and x3 data x, because x2 is 0.6 and x3 is 1.0. I, those two values I use for 0.75, because those are the two closest values of x that surround the x value at which I like to interpolate. So that's why I define here that my data x are those two values and the corresponding data y values are those two values. Now then I set up, you can linearly interpolate then, and this is similar to using a Lagrange basis but just with two data points. Now. So essentially, when you do linear interpolation or spline interpolation, we'll get to that later, you have a set of data with x and y values, and the important thing is to just find the closest y value or the closest x values. Yeah? And you don't want to do that manually, because let's say that you have a really large data set with 10,000 data points of x versus y, and you have to start looking, okay, which ones are so, uh, uh, surround the values that I like to interpolate at? So the author wrote a script, and I think I'm in the, I need to change directory here one second, the lecture 20, and then this is a script the author wrote where I returns the closest x value. So you know that if I have 100 values of x and i is 79, then I know that x79 is at the closest value at the lower end of my x value at which I like to interpolate, okay? So if I have, for instance, x are values from 1 through 10, yeah, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 10, so that's 10 values, and my x value at which I like to interpolate is 5.5, then if I execute this script, what's going to happen is that i is going to be, now 1, 2, 3, it's going to be 5, because 5.5 is between 5 and 6, it gives the lower end value, so it gives 5. Then I immediately know, and that's what you see here, x hat 
is the value at which we like to interpolate, and x are my x values. So, and it's a simple script that's useful, because then we don't have to search really, um, like the same here. X end is 2, and does this make sense? Our x values were this, and our interpolated value was at 0.75. Now you see that indeed that 0.6 is the one that's closest to the one that we like to interpolate of x, and then at the lower end. So we know then that we need to take x2 and x3 to do the linear interpolation or any other type of interpolation. So this, this code, this script, the author wrote because, like me, he's lazy, he wants the computer to do the work, and it just tells you which values of x do I need to take to interpolate, and then you can do any type of interpolation you want, like he wrote a script that's called linear interpolation, so here you have your x values, here you have your corresponding y values, and here the xi is the value at which you like to interpolate, so that gives you the corresponding y value, yi. Now, so the first thing the author does on line 11 is where he's, he is looking for in the data set of x, he looks, okay, my xi at which I like to interpolate, which x value is closest to my xi value, but then at the lower end, yeah? So it needs to be smaller. Now, then he sets up the basis functions. This is the same as these Lagrange basis functions, and it's the same as linear interpolation, L1 and L2. And then he defines here that my interpolated value is yi, yeah, so that's the value of y corresponding to xi that was found with this bin search times l1 plus i, yi plus 1, that's the next value of y at xi plus 1 times l2. So this is how you can write a very simple script that does linear interpolation in MATLAB has has this built in, okay? Here, 1D interpolation here, that's called interp1, 1D, because you got the 1D interpolation is just a time series, you have x versus y. You can also have something that's two-dimensional, imagine that you like to interpolate, you're on a soccer field, and you have to interpolate in two dimensions. We only look at one-dimensional problems. The final assignment that you're going to do is actually in two dimensions. You need an interpolator in two dimensions. Okay? So, and these are all the different possibilities of interpolation. So, the linear interpolation is a possibility. That's one possible choice. So, I can use this interp1, and I can define as an input argument at the end that I want linear interpolation. I can also do <coughs> spline interpolation, or p-chip, or cubic. So these are the ones that we'll talk about on Friday. These are built-in functions, easy to use, and these are typically the ones you need to know for the exam, okay? And the monomial and the Lagrange basis, because those are relatively easy. The Newton basis, have a look at it. It's a lot of math, but it's highly unlikely that we'll ask a question about it, and if we do, we'll provide all the theory needed to do that successfully.